Good afternoon and welcome to today's session, Telehealth Triage with the Interpreter on Demand Integration. Martin I have had the honor and privilege of working with our speakers and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to host this conversation uh, regarding the community-based programs that UVA has championed and the lessons learned through their journeys. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our panel today. Uh, first, Dr. Karen Ruban, the Professor of Pediatrics and Senior Associate Dean for Continuing Medical Education and External Affairs at the University of Virginia, and Eric Hope, the Manager of Corporate Accounts at Language Services Associate. He's been with LSA for over 15 years. So let's get started. Communicating with patients is essential to delivering essential effective care. And during a pandemic, the urgency for effective communication is amplified as concerned patients, both current and new, fear the emergency department and potential exposure to the virus. In response to COVID-19, UVA quickly initiated a solution to operate on-demand urgent care clinics for adults and children, many of whom were, limited, uh, with, were of limited English proficiency or were hear, hearing impaired. So Karen, let me start with you. Before the COVID-19 crisis, where was UVA in their thinking and planning for telehealth? Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Kaladner. It's a pleasure to be on this um, webinar with you and with uh, Eric. So uh, UVA's telemedicine program has been operational for 25 years and was primarily facility-based. So we connected with community hospitals, uh, federally qualified health centers, um, uh, Virginia Department of Health sites, correctional facilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but did very little work to the home other than what we did with remote patient monitoring, which was certainly a significant element of our program. Um, and uh, so we did not really perform regularly scheduled virtual care appointments to a home or other non-facility-based setting. Uh, and uh, we, we did uh, avail ourselves of interpretation skills while we were using telemedicine, uh, including sign language, ASL. Um, uh, we often would have an interpreter either present during the encounter or accessible via the telephone. Uh, but that all changed post-COVID-19. Okay, thank okay. you. Sure. And, and, and how did COVID-19 change those plans? Sure. So um, actually, I should also mention that we uh, entered into a telemedicine, telehealth strategic plan as an institution in 2019. Uh, that was at the direction of the CEO of the UVA health system and was an important process. It was a multi-stakeholder process, which um, uh, led us to plan to uh, advance direct to consumer telemedicine, which we had not done. As I mentioned, we hadn't done, provided those services to the home. However, uh, because we had some leadership changes, we did not actually uh, implement it, waiting for our new EVP for health sciences and our new CEO. Uh, so, um, and that, that, those individuals arrived in February. And then of course, fast forward, a few weeks later, COVID-19 arrived as well. So our approach to COVID-19 was an all hands on deck approach uh, to convert uh, in-person clinic visits to virtual visits. Um, and we also uh, deployed technology within our own emergency department and in our um, uh, isolation rooms using telemedicine tools to be what we would call virtual PPE, uh, which um, uh, provided an important role to protect our workforce and also to ensure that patients got to see their providers uh, without all the cumbersome PPE. Um, we also advanced more remote patient monitoring services for our patients, advanced more e-consults for our patients as, uh, for our, between our providers, uh, referring providers and specialty providers, uh, and implemented um, Project ECHO. So all of these things were uh, all hands on deck, but one of the most important things we needed to do was to provide uh, a virtual urgent care solution for our um, patients and our providers. And as such, we worked with, um, well, we, we checked out the market. We had to do this very, very quickly. And no one could offer us within a few weeks time from, um, from, uh, from making this request to actually implementing a virtual urgent care solution other than what was available for COVID-19 only. But we felt we needed it for our patients who had other medical conditions, but who were otherwise very anxious and concerned about going to the emergency department. And we also had scaled back our after hours clinic operations as well. So there was need to provide access to care 
after hours uh, for patients who did not want to necessarily travel to the emergency department. So that's a quick summary of where we were and where we are now. Well, and, and certainly uh, VitalNet has uh, been honored that you selected us to uh, provide that virtual urgent care as the first of several things. So what solutions did, you know, uh, are you exploring as you move forward? Um, and and uh, you, you mentioned that you wanted more than just uh, virtual urgent care. Right. So we've seen actually a 9,000% increase in our visits conducted to the home. Uh, and we are actually exploring all platforms. Uh, but it is important for us that we have accessibility to all our patients. And in particular, our virtual urgent care platform uh, is being um, marketed to patients throughout Virginia. And so it is really important to us that we serve patients and we have those interpretive skills integrated into the offering that we provide. Uh, and we certainly will be expanding uh, uh, other services as I discussed. We, um, I actually had the opportunity to testify in Congress last week and showed some maps in my testimony about how we scaled uh, services across the Commonwealth of Virginia from our traditional referral area to other areas across the Commonwealth. We know that patients in the Northern Virginia area um, speak multiple languages. We also have a broad range of, um, of patients within even the Charlottesville region who speak multiple languages. We work with the International Rescue Committee as well. So it is important for us to have uh, the ability to access um, interpretive services. With, with regard to the EHR and the integration uh, uh, of, the, of the data there? Oh, sure. So um, uh, one of the things that we determined right away is that it is really important to have integration within our electronic medical record, which is EPIC. Um, and uh, we will not implement any solution that isn't integrated into EPIC. That's very important to us. And uh, as such, we document within EPIC. Uh, we we uh, launch and we hope to continue to launch within EPIC. Uh, and as well, um, we accomplish um, billing and compliance as well through our electronic medical record. And, and did you have any requirements regarding uh, you know, what sort of app you wanted patients to download? Um, well, so that's another really uh, interesting question. So we prefer to use WebRTC as much as possible rather than having um, our patients have to download an app. We much prefer to send them a link and have them click on it so we're easily accessible. But again, pulling in interpretive skills is, uh, would have otherwise been a challenge if we had not uh, integrated the solution that was provided to us by VitalNet. And that's an, uh, a, a great transition uh, over to you, Eric. Uh, certainly, uh, we've had some, uh, we've been working together for a while. Can you tell us about your experience with VitalNet integration uh, versus other telehealth software platforms? Sure, Dr. Kladner, and thank you for having me on this panel. Um, you know, effective language access um, in a healthcare environment is so vital. It's vital for positive healthcare outcomes. It's vital for compliance and legal purposes. Uh, oftentimes, however, it's an afterthought. Um, to VitalNet's credit, they put that uh, up front and solve for that issue long before uh, deploying this solution. Um, they've saved their clients the time and trouble of having to figure it out on the fly, especially during a pandemic, as, as many have. Uh, the VitalNet solution is, is truly embedded. It's purpose-driven uh, compared to other solutions out there, ad hoc solutions, workaround solutions. It's very elegant and represents the deepest level of integration that we as an organization have achieved thus far. Um, it's designed to be easy, faster, and better for both the clinician as well as for the patient. Within just a couple of clicks, the objective is to get a medically qualified uh, video interpreter into the telehealth select, uh, uh, session uh, without sending that request outside the clinical workflow. And I believe that this solution will be the standard moving forward. Prior to COVID, what you saw in a telehealth world was a very clunky, thrown together, cobbled together solution involving um, different devices where I would, if I was a clinician, have to put a speakerphone next to the telehealth unit and have a voice interpreter on the phone. 
uh, or I would position an iPad such that uh, a video interpreter could do a glass to glass communication with the patient. Um, oftentimes, aside from being um, inefficient and effective, uh, was frustrating um, for both uh, patient and provider. It sort of defeated the whole purpose of telehealth. Um, telehealth was designed to solve a lot of problems. Language barrier was not one of them, unfortunately. Um, so fast forward to COVID, um, for those organizations that hadn't yet solved for that, um, they suddenly needed to get an interpreter into a telehealth solution um, in, in any way they could virtually. Um, so whereas there's the right way to do things, which I believe is the vital net way, there's the right now way. And we've spent a lot of time over the last uh, three to four months um, answering the call to come up with creative right now ways to get that interpreter, that same interpreter into a session through Zoom or Doxy. And the, the end result um, is the same. The interpreter comes into the session. Um, the process is slightly different because the technology differs platform to platform. So the process is slightly different as well. Um, a bit longer, a bit uh, clunkier, um, which is why I think the vital net um, way of doing things will be the standard moving forward. Um, healthcare systems and platform providers, um, because they've, they've had to um, settle for a workaround solution, are fine to do it for now. And I think they'll be fine to do it for the next uh, few months, but many of them are already working on uh, more purposeful, elegant, truly embedded solutions like the one that LSA and VitalNet have achieved together. Thank you, Thank you Eric. And, and certainly from VitalNet's point of view, it's been a pleasure working with you and, uh, and having uh, such a responsive uh, and uh, agile group like LSA so that uh, with one button, uh, we can bring you in, uh, select the language and bring, bring in an interpreter uh, right into the uh, reading part of the workflow. The feeling is mutual, uh, and, thank you. Okay, and Dr. Ruben, uh, the final question for you, uh, with all of the things that have been going on, what sort of lessons have you learned? What sort of uh, challenges have you needed to address uh, uh, with all of the uh, virtual care and COVID-19 uh, activities that you've been doing? Oh, thank you for asking, uh, Dr. Kladner. Well, I, I'm, I might say um, what we had planned and intended and hoped to have as a, uh, uh, a thoughtful iterative process of expanding um, uh, virtual care at UVA as part of our strategic planning process was required an all hands on deck approach immediately. Uh, so as with all all hands on deck approaches, you one had to get uh, all stakeholders on board, not just the clinicians, but they are important stakeholders, but our registration staff, our billing and compliance staff, um, the technology teams, the, uh, and, and, and we also had to deal with how do we manage um, tech support? We had to identify, uh, you know, is it the telemedicine team is going to be providing technical support? Thankfully, VitalNet offered us 24-7 technical support for our patients, which was imperative. Uh, so that was really important to us as well. Um, and ease of use is really important for us as well. So again, having one click. And remember, uh, you know, although we had workflows in place for when we needed to provide interpretive services for patients who um, were seen from our clinical settings, um, we didn't have it when our providers were at home. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, our providers were also working from home. So again, a seamless integration of these interpretive services were really, was really important to us. You know, um, we are still working through some of our own institutional challenges, bringing folks on board. But as I mentioned, a 9,000% increase um, in virtual uh, services is pretty amazing for us. Um, and it took a lot of work to get all the teams on board. Our strategic planning process was, a, thankfully, a multi-stakeholder working group. So most of the system was familiar, but again, racing to deploy in the middle of a pandemic um, was still a bit of a challenge, but we are, um, I'm, I'm thrilled that my, my colleagues across the health system have embraced virtual technologies and I'm delighted that our emergency medicine physicians have, are part of this as well. Excellent. Uh, 
So thank you both. Uh, I think now we are looking to questions from the audience. Uh, we do have a question in, so let me uh, uh, read it to you. How are you addressing gaps in connectivity and access to the internet, particularly for rural remote locations in providing the services and, and avoiding increasing the healthcare disparities for the underserved? And obviously there's a services side and a technical side. So Karen, you want to Take it sure. First. Sure. Uh, this uh, this is an excellent question, and it is a real issue, and it remains a real issue. Uh, we have found that almost a third of the patients to whom we connect uh, virtually, or we, we we seek to connect virtually, do not have broadband capability, and we've had to revert to using the telephone. Um, and uh, while um, that's suboptimal. Thankfully, you know, the federal government and our state Medicaid programs and Medicare have enabled the use of telephone codes. So that is an important um, uh, application for us. Uh, but we also are working with the Federal Communications Commission to deploy broadband more broadly uh, uh, because quite frankly, access to broadband is a health equity issue. So it's a wonderful question uh, and is truly important uh, uh, to providing virtual care. I will say that VitalNet has been incredibly helpful in helping our patients navigate through that to test um, their connectivity. Uh, the platform enables that as well, but it is, uh, it is a challenge for us and for our patients, especially because while Charlottesville is not itself a rural area, we serve many patients um, from rural and underserved communities. Okay, and from the technical point of view, obviously, if, if there isn't connectivity, we can't give internet access. On the other hand, uh, a key part of this is that for uh, individuals who are not tech savvy, uh, but may have a smartphone or a computer to make it as simple as possible for them to uh, have access um, and to be able to use, uh, the, to be able to connect uh, without having to do downloads or other complicated uh, maneuvers but simply having a link to click, to click on uh, and to connect and, and be able to uh, see their provider. And just another shout out to the Federal Communications Commission, which uh, just approved but hasn't released the RFP yet for the Connected Care Pilot Program, which will um, uh, provide support for expanded connectivity to the home of the patients. And those are either um, medically underserved patients, low-income patients, or veterans. Very good. Uh, that's the only question we have now. Let me uh, wait a few moments to see if any other questions come in. And if not, uh, let me thank you both for uh, participating on the panel today. Again, it's been a pleasure working with uh, both of you and your companies. Uh, and thank all of the attendees uh, for joining us here today.